We've never met, so this is first introductions for everybody. I'm Lexi Liam. I'm a farm energy specialist here at Organic Valley, and I'm also an Organic Valley farmer myself, so it's super great to meet you, Jordan. Yes, it's nice to meet you as well. Hey, good morning, Jordan and everybody online. My name is Zach Bierman, and I work in the carbon insetting program with Lexi. I'm the cropland and compost manure specialist. I've worked for the co-op 27 years this year, and... Um, it's a, it's a wonderful day here in the Kickapoo Valley at, uh, at the Cobb Building in Cashin. Uh, we've finally been getting some, some rain, so we're just about as green as you, Jordan, now. Oh, that's good. We've been <laughs> incredibly dry here, so, um, but yeah. thankfully we still got some good pasture. So, Yeah, we've been really dry here also. We only had around four inches of rain the entire summer, so... And lately, we've had several inches of rain in the last couple of weeks. But yeah, we were as dry as I've ever seen in my whole lifetime here in, in the valley. So, Jordan, can you tell us where you are? Look yeah, so views. I'm in St. Mary's, Ohio, and uh, so we're between New Knoxville and St. Mary's, and uh, that'd be Western Ohio. And uh, we've been farming here for 150 years through the family. I'm a sixth generation farmer, wow. and so uh, yeah, that, but that's where we're located. And look at fall is has arrived at your farm. Look at those beautiful colors behind you. Yeah. So, you know, earlier, I believe it was uh, Ty was saying that all their beautiful fall foliage had blown off. But uh, thankfully, oh we still have some of that here for everybody to see and enjoy today. So, yeah, the trees in the background are changing color. And this happens to be my favorite time of year. I always enjoy the fall. Uh, I like cool weather and, uh, the cows like cool weather as well. So, mm. so yeah, it's pretty much, uh, it doesn't get much better than this. If you guys like cool weather, like Jordan and myself, uh, give us some love in the chat. Um, I agree. I think at our, at our farm, like Zach was saying earlier, um, we were pretty dry and pretty warm this whole summer. And the second our that we got some cool, cooler temperatures, we let the cows out and they were just kicking and dancing. And I, it was like their whole new personalities showed up. So it sounds like our cows are pretty similar. Yeah. I think cows, uh, it doesn't matter where they're at across the country. They're going to enjoy being out in something like this. You know, it just doesn't get much better for a cow than this. This is what cows are designed to do. Be out in lush green pastures, grazing away, hauling their own manure and uh, just really getting the whole, the whole system going um, the way it's designed to go. And uh, that's something that we're big believers here on our farm is that, uh, you know, we're trying to manage this whole ecosystem to the best of our abilities. So we want these cows out here grazing, grazing fresh green uh, greens that you can see here, like the alfalfas and the grasses and the clovers. And um, so they're going to take all that that they're grazing and then they're going to eat it down. They're going to turn that into delicious, nutritious, uh, nutrient packed milk. And then uh, while they're out here, they're also going to do some, bathroom breaks of course and uh, those bathroom <laughs> breaks end up going back into the soil one of the amazing mm -hmm. things about soil once it gets going and and uh really working it digests that manure very very rapidly and that goes down back into the soil and then the plants pull the nutrients back out of that and grow green again um and along while all that's happening when you have all this in pasture like it is it's like a big giant green sponge across the landscape so when it rains right. the water's trapped here it's not running off into our rivers and streams and uh, all the nutrients are trapped here as well. So it's just a really cool system. And uh, that's just, that's what we believe in on our farm. Jo Jordan, can I ask you, when you're talking about nutrient management and moving the cattle around, and um, how often do you rotate your cattle or how long are they on one particular piece of pasture before you move them to the next? Oh yeah, it's an excellent question. Thanks for asking. So uh, as we can see, the cows are actually entering right now uh, behind me right there. And so we come in, uh, through a candlestick system. So it's a single wire and we lift that wire up and then they come into this piece and they're going to be grazing this for one day. And then once they're done out here, they'll be going off further in the distance that way. And, uh, <laughs> so behind you, <laughs> it's a little, yeah, it's behind me. So we're moving to the North. So I don't yeah. know if you can tell my facing right now, but I, I can walk over and show where we grazed yesterday and, uh, sure. or actually into last night, into this morning where they would have been when we brought the cows up for milking this morning, um, would have looked like this last night. In fact, I was on the phone last night and showing off, uh, what we were grazing and that's behind okay. me and you can tell it's all grazed off and now it's short so how um, it how, looks they were on that piece of ground for 24 hours or now they were only on milkings? that piece of ground for about about eight hours in between eight milkings. hours and yep yeah and so they grazed it off completely and then where we're at now 
you can see is green. Well, you can see the stripe right there of where the divider line was. Yep. Um, so do you use a power so, yeah. to, to back them to keep them off of where they had already grazed or not? Do they just stay where they yeah. So we, when we put them into a new paddock, they're always getting a complete new paddock. So they're going to be getting everywhere that they're standing, grazing, laying down, everything is going to be new from where they were before. And the way we're keeping them divided yep. is this little wire right here. And I don't want to touch it because it's on. I meant to turn it off <laughs> for video reasons oh, so on, I could touch, touch it and whatnot. Touch it <laughs> no, we're not doing that experiment today. So, uh, But no, it's just this little tiny wire is all that's keeping them in the field. And uh, there would be one over on the far side. So we call this the back wire. And then yep. the one that's on the front of the paddock is the lead wire. And then, so when we go to change them after the next milking or the, but tomorrow morning, we'll be pulling this wire out, rolling it up and the lead wire will become the back wire and there'll be a new lead wire put in and we'll make an entrance point uh, with a candlestick where we just lift the wire up in the air, which I can show that off too, if people are interested in seeing sure. it. Why don't you take us to go see some of the cows? We've had some questions uh, before. Do cows talk to each other? Uh, what are they doing right now? And can we see them up close? We're just making you yeah. hike today. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. A so we're in a pretty big paddock. We got quite a few cows in here. And sometimes they're in a mood where they're just all about the attention. And sometimes they're not. So we'll have to see. Uh, we'll see how curious they want to be. So, But yeah, cows... Uh, there's a lot of uh, cow psychology things to know as a farmer. And there's a lot that's just uh, interesting about cows. But cows have cows have friends. Cows have their same little cliques and their social groups. Cows have cows that they don't like. Uh, mm -hmm. For the most part, cows will run in a linear hierarchy. So you have a boss cow. And you have one leader cow out of all these cows that's in charge and always in charge. And for a lot of years, we had a cow named Bridget. And Bridget was the lead cow for about... Uh, eight years and um didn't matter where bridget went everybody else was going along if she decided to go there this happens to be blue dozer right here Hi, blue, dozer. Dozer. Uh, blue dozer blue yeah. dozer yeah she the boss all right well no she's not she's uh <laughs> hey where are you going girl uh we'll try she's to find princess princess is uh the most obnoxious cow we got as far as personality <laughs> goes for loving people so she's a real uh she thinks he's a dog, I think. So, Jordan, <laughs> you're talking about your cows. This is probably an awful question to ask you, but do you have a favorite cow? And I know that's probably like, or favorites. We won't tell the other we cows. Won't, we won't tell them. <laughs> right. Our mouths are I, shut. Do you hear that, guys? I absolutely <laughs> have favorites. Yeah. So oh, my yeah. number one favorite cow is Dagny. And I don't see Dagny. her right here offhand. So her number is 606. She happens to be one of these cows that's almost solid black. And uh, she's just a really good cow. She was one of the first cows that we raised on her mom. So she, mm -hmm. we raised a lot of our calves on their moms. And so the, they, she nursed her mom, was raised by her mom, hung out with her mom for the first uh, four or five months of her life. And then um, just was a cool heifer. And so a heifer would be a younger cow that uh, still has never had a baby and is not in milk. It's just like an adolescent cow. And then uh, she came into milk in 2018. And uh, she's... Uh, had a calf every single spring since. She's just a really good producing cow. She's a, she's not friendly, but she's not not friendly. Mm -hmm. um, she's just, she's one of those just great cows. She just business. does what she's supposed to do. And yeah, <laughs> she, she knows what's going on. So this is princess right here. Oh yeah. Hi princess. Hi. Princess, can you say yeah. hi to all the school kids that have joined us? Oh, yeah. well, Folks from New York, from Ohio. Let's give princess some love. You want to be on TV? <laughs> it's got a nice hairdo oh yeah kisses there you go right up there <laughs> uh, usually she's more friendly than this usually she's like trying to eat my hat and everything else but sure. a little maybe a little today. camera shy today so yeah. what is princess's breed here jordan i can guess so but i a, would love for you to tell us yeah she's a jersey so mm -hmm. she's like full blood jersey and um it shows. So um, <laughs> there's different breeds of cows. And there's, you got your primary dairy breeds in the United States are going to be your Holsteins and Jerseys. And uh, Holsteins are usually the bigger, taller, black and white ones. Uh, I got uh, a couple right there in the background. Other side of my head. 
<laughs> Anyways, yep. wherever there are, those are your whole scenes. Your jerseys are gonna be these tan ones, like her, and uh, with some dark points. Jerseys are gonna be the ones that make your higher butter fat, uh, a little bit lower producing on milk, and your whole scenes are gonna be your higher producers on milk, a little bit lower on the component side, so a little bit less butter fat. You know, they're they're kind of like naturally making skim milk, where uh, your jerseys are naturally making whole milk, and mm-hmm. um, I mean that's not entirely true, but you know for for a uh, simple understanding, that would be the kind of a big difference. Jersey's mature weight, they're going to be somewhere around 1,000 pounds. Mature Holstein's going to be 1,250, 1,350, 1,450. Um, people breed for different sizes and statures and whatnot. Um, and then on our farm, I don't know if you noticed in the background, but we have lots of breeds of cows. So we have your jerseys, yeah. like we saw Princess. Uh, we had the Holsteins that were in the background. We have Blue Dozer that we showed a minute ago. She's like 7% milking shorthorn, 93% Holstein. Um, and that's where you get that cool blue color that comes through. And um, I didn't talk on her much, but Blue Dozer's Blue Dozer because she acts like a bulldozer. And mm. she's a little bit blue. So <laughs> she's Blue Dozer. And Jordan, how do you come up with your cows' names? These are pretty unique, and I'm in love with all of them, and I might use some of them on our, my own farm. But what, right. what inspires you? Uh, just uh, a lot of different things. I'll try to find Mawingu. Mawingu is one of my favorite named cows, and she's another one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> okay. and, and, but, uh, so, yeah, coming up with names. So sometimes it's just their personality. Um, Mm -hmm. how they act and behave and they just kind of get a name that sticks to them. Like blue dozer happens to be blue and acts like a bulldozer. (laughs) And then, uh, Mawingu, Mawingu actually means cloud in Swahili. And, uh, we had a guy that worked for us. So from Tanzania and he spoke Swahili and said, she's like as light as a cloud. She just dances on her feet. So he named her, uh, Mawingu. And then, um, nice Dagny, uh, see Dagny came from a book. Um, princess was named by my daughter. So, Mm. Uh, I'm married. I have three kids, um, and my daughter uh, Nora really likes Princess. And we asked her what we should name her. She said, "I think we need to name her Princess." So, Princess is the name that she got. Jordan, on our farm, we have uh, Mont Bellard crosses with Holsteins, and I know that you also have that breed in your um, in your herd. Can you tell us a little bit why you think um, it's important, or why you crossbreed your cows? Yeah. So right here is a Mont Bellard cross. Which happens to be Mawingu, right mm. there, Hi, Mawingu. That red cow with a red cow with a white face. Yeah, so um, there's different reasons for why people cross or why they like to cross. We like to cross breed because you get a lot of um, a lot of benefit from each of the breeds, especially in a first generation cross. And um, so we're crossing like jerseys onto Holstein. That way we can kind of reduce their stature and get kind of a smaller overall framed cow that has still has some good components, but yet good milk production. And then we really like going back to the Mont Billiard. Uh, in our experience, these Mont Billiards, like Mawingu right here in the background, um, they bring a little bit more meat on the bone for the cow. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for an athletic build on our cows. We want some olympic uh athletes out here because our cows have to walk to the field and they need to be back and forth so we're not trying to breed for runway models we're trying to breed for ronda rousey's which was a ufc fighter um Mm -hmm. we're trying to get you know just a little bit more frame on a cow uh, Mm -hmm. because they need to be able to carry themselves we're expecting them to walk to the field uh twice a day we're expecting them to raise their babies we're expecting them to carry all their manure back to the field and we're expecting them to be out in the field grazing while they're out here so we just want cows that are going to be built and designed for around our system can you tell us why you decided to be a farmer why you chose this career uh i think it chose me no yeah. um, i don't know I, I, it does sometimes I grew up, it did so i grew up here i grew up farming and uh, i guess a little bit of my whole backstory then is when i was in fifth grade i wrote my first report in mrs waterman's class which maybe she's listening in she's the the let's hope so. superintendent uh, superintendent <laughs> at the school where my children go. And, um, but no, I wrote a report in fifth grade about when I grow up, I'm going to be a dairy farmer. And then uh, when I was a little bit older, I told my dad that when I grow up, I'm going to be a dairy farmer. And he's like, yeah, you're, <laughs> I grew up milking cows. We're not milking cows. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I worked on it. He said, you get a job working for a dairy farmer. Let me know if you really want to milk cows. And so I did, I got a job working for a local dairyman when I was in high school and it was a fantastic experience. A uh, great guy, great family. And then, uh, actually went in the military and did that for a few years, got out, went to college, graduated college and said, dad, I want to be a dairyman. And so uh, <laughs> he's like, all right, let's do it. And so we started through. with dairy. And then that night actually, uh, the day that we got approved to ship milk through the state of Ohio, 
went to an Organic Valley procurement meeting and uh, met uh, our RPM Rose Smith and some other uh, employees at Organic Valley. And I said, hey, you know, this is really aligned with my philosophy of, uh, of dairy farming. And this is something that we want to do. And so we did. And uh, so, yeah, we've been doing this now for about uh, eight eight years, I guess. And uh, yeah, I really like the, the idea of pasturing cows, really like the idea of the whole organic system and uh, everything once I learned about it, you know, it's just, it's really aligned with uh, working with nature, as I said before, and uh, working with uh, the ecosystem and just trying to manage it and ride that wave and uh, try to do things to the best of our ability uh, every single day. Well, shout out to all those people who were there at the right time to encourage you to come to Organic Valley. We're really happy to have you as one of our members. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's the schedule of a farmer? Um, I know it's different. Uh, we probably didn't wake up at the same time. Um, so can you just give us a little glimpse at what time do you wake up? What are the chores like? What have you already done today? Right. So every day is a little bit different on our farm. So we actually do a 10 and 7 milking schedule. So we milk roughly every 16 hours, um, but it comes out to there's 168 hours in a week. So um, that's a couple extra hours and a couple milkings in there. But uh, yeah, so we wake up bright and early and bring the cows up. And so they would have been uh, in that field like I showed earlier over there and uh, brought the cows up got everybody milked, got them a little breakfast. So um, we've been really dry here this year. So we are feeding our cow or supplementing some feed up at the bunk. So they got to eat a nice little breakfast. It also had all their multivitamins and minerals and all that uh, stuff in it. And then uh, we set up fence out here. So we set up this new paddock with the wires, like I talked about before. And uh, yeah, and then uh, I got on this call. So um, and different days are different things. So during the summer, we'll spend hours making hay uh, for winter feed so the cows can eat the same stuff in the winter. So we make a lot of baleage, which would be essentially the same stuff we see in the background here, the alfalfa, clover, grasses mixed together, put into bales and uh, stored up at the farm so that the cows can have basically the same diet uh, prepared and ready for them all winter long. Uh, some days we're working with cows. Um, we have cows having babies all the time. So we're dealing with uh, taking care of the babies as they're born and making sure that everything's getting going right in their life right out of the gate. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a, a normal day. And then you always have your bad days where things break or people don't show up or people do show up that weren't supposed to show up or sales people <laughs> show up. And, you know, it's, uh, it's fun. <laughs> well, Margo from Florida wants to know, Jordan, what is your favorite organic Valley product? Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, fluid milk. I, uh, hmm. I drink half a gallon to a gallon of milk a day and uh it's just for me it doesn't get any better than just some straight milk from a cow and uh, <laughs> but but since that's kind of a cheap answer i guess i will go with the stringles uh, i know a lot of people say stringles but the stringles are just so dang good and they're so handy um so i could live on stringles and milk hey stringles do you eat them with a bite or do you peel them and eat them slow <laughs> Okay. It just depends on uh, the, the situation. So uh, if, I have, if I have time to enjoy my stringle, it's definitely necessary that you peel it and eat it one little piece at a time. And then when you get right about to the last 15%, you got to really you know, strip down little pieces and savor every moment of it. But if I'm in a hurry, I just chunk that thing down. So... Yeah. I have been an Organic Valley kid my whole life. So stringles, I think in body weight, I'm like half strangled probably <laughs> at this point. Um, and I, I just bite them straight through. Yeah. So I don't know. We might be starting ch some fights in the chat. I'm not sure, <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, got pool is, going. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you bite your strangles, let us know. If you pull your strangles, let us know. There's no right way. That's what we're going to say. Keep eating. Fair enough. Just keep eat, yeah, just exactly. Keep just keep, eat, keep eating them. <laughs> So Jordan, speaking of food for your cows, we're out on the pasture. They're eating right now. Um, seasonally, what makes up your cow's diet? Is it primarily grass or do, are you feeding them anything else? Yeah, so we're primarily a, uh, a pasture-based grass dairy. Um, we are not on the, or we do not ship grass milk, so we do feed a little bit of corn. But for the most part, they're going to be eating what we see right here, which this has already been kind of grazed through. And uh, this is going to be your alfalfa, clover, uh, bird's foot trefoil. Uh, and then we have like four or five different grasses out here. And that's the main focus of their diet. So we're trying to create a 
very dense pasture sorted out here that has a lot of different species growing in it. And the way we try to kind of explain that a little bit is my, one of my favorite foods is a bacon wrap filet mignon. And, mm. uh, so the, the legumes out here are like the bacon, the filet mignon itself is like the grasses. And then we also have stuff like, uh, chicory, mm. which is what's seen right here. And, um, this is a chicory leaf, chicory and plantain. And we put that out here and that's kind of like the salt and pepper <laughs> for the cows. So tastes salt terrible. I'm not a big fan <laughs> of chicory, but it's the salt and pepper to the bacon wrap flame and yawn. So you're making me hungry with that bacon wrap bacon flame and yawn. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah, yeah, me too. So we have a red clover, red oh, there clover yeah. bloom oh, yeah. that got destroyed. Um, that'd be like a, a red clover. Um, people see these mm -hmm. in their yards. Probably they probably see a lot more white clover in their yard. Um, but yeah, that's what, uh, the primary diet is, but look at so him. Once again, <laughs> he's just eating not the my, pasture. Eat her away. Yeah. Not my favorite flavors, but you know, <laughs> a cow seem to really enjoy them. So I've, yeah. uh, awesome. we taste test the pasture pretty often ourselves actually. And what we've learned is that mm. cows really seem to like bitter plants and then they like sweet plants. So mm. if you ever eat a red clover bloom, it's pretty sweet. People make tea yeah. out of them. They're mm. pretty sweet. Awesome. I agree. Well, shout out to all the school folks who are joining. We're really excited to have you here. Jordan, um, is there anything you want to say to any of the, the schools that have joined us? Any message, personal well, if, message? If my boys are watching, both my boys go to New Knoxville school. And so if uh, New Knoxville school's on here watching, let's say hi to Micah and Asher Settledge. And uh, thanks for watching. And thanks to all the other schools that are watching. So uh, I think it's just neat that uh, there's children across the country that are seeing how cows are out on pasture today and seeing how farming works um, underneath the organic system. And that's just, uh, it's really cool. Oh my gosh. <laughs> there's one of the friendly cows. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Yeah. Look at that. Jordan ha Jordan's hat's going to go away. We'll yep. have to get him a new one. Hey. A new hat. <laughs> we will. So, yeah, she's uh, decided now that she wants to be on TV, I guess. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the their, nerves their have, the like, have gone away. Yep. Yeah, so their tongues are like sandpaper, and that's not exactly <laughs> yeah. a pleasant feeling. Hey, we've got a surprise from New York. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's see the clip. Oh. Jordan, how does it feel seeing your face? In New on York. the big screen. Oh, that's kind of wild. Yeah, I would have never expected <laughs> that. Um, and I didn't get uh, cued into that that was going to be happening. So that was uh, that's fun. <laughs> a little surprise uh, for um, you. Yeah, that's a fun surprise. So I don't know. We were in New York a couple weeks ago for Organic mm -hmm. Valley's big launch of protecting where your food comes from. And they put up a small farm in the middle of the city. And it was just a really neat event. Um, got a lot of consumers out and seeing farmers and talking to farmers and kind of showing off how we – how we farm organically. So yeah, that's pretty cool being in Times Square. So Jordan, you were talking a little bit before about the cow's tongue feeling like sandpaper. Um, what else is unique about cows that maybe people don't know? Everything. About? <laughs> Everything. Uh, <laughs> what's unique that people don't know about cows? <sighs> that's no, this a, might that's be a, a really good question. question. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's interesting how their whole digestive system works. So that's a, a fascinating uh, aspect of cows that some people don't realize that uh, they have a chambered stomach and the way that they're able to eat all these forages, which people can't digest, at least not at a very uh, high percentage. And they're able to eat all these forages, all this green grass, lush stuff growing out here. They're able to put that down into their stomachs and then they'll go lay down and rest and uh, ruminate. And then they'll start uh, regurgitating what they have already eaten once and re-eating what they ate once. <laughs> and then that uh, helps their, that's the way their digestive system works. And so it's just pretty fascinating. And the fact that they can take the plant fibers and turn that into delicious white milk that we can turn into cream for a coffee and cheese sticks and all that fun stuff. So that's pretty fascinating about cows. Um, <laughs> and Jordan, yeah, you said stomachs, just to clarify. <laughs> it's, uh, it gets into an <laughs> argument. And I'm sure a vet will end up correcting me on it. So they have a four chambered <laughs> stomach and some okay. people think they have four stomachs but it's they have a rumen the abomasum a mason and a reticulum and that's um 
those are big fancy words, but basically it's just, <laughs> it's a stomach system that's different than how people's are. So they just mm-hmm. have different chambers and they swallow their food and it goes down and then it goes to these different chambers and then, uh, it passes out the, the back end of the cow. So, mm-hmm. um, also we have some love. Oh gosh. I keep hiding them. Marina loves Jordan. We love Jordan here at Organic Valley. Again, celebrity status. There's Clovis. Look at. Can we give some love to Jordan in the chat? Like, give us some hearts. Oh, that's Can great. Can do that? Oh, Molly said hi. This is what it's like at Organic Valley. We just have fun here. Uh, <laughs> we do. It's a very, it's a really cool co-op. And that's what I would say for anybody that's uh, watching across the country. You know, this is a co-op that really, <clears throat> really cares about their mission really cares about their farmers and really cares about what we're doing for the planet and what we're doing for protecting uh, the soils, protecting the plants, protecting animals, protecting people, protecting your food. Um, it's a lot of different things going on at once, but you know, OV cares and mm-hmm. they show that. Absolutely. Zach, did you find a good question? I'm getting there. <laughs> he's, he's, he's shuffling through a few. Got to get the right one. Well, this one comes back from, cause I've been here for 27 years. So I remember some of this stuff. So Let's uh, ask you, Jordan, did Organic Valley ever sell organic orange juice? Uh, Trivia. I, I'm, I'm going to go with no. <laughs> organic Valley did sell orange juice oh, in the late man. 90s. So, um, wow. That was when I started in 1996 here at Organic Valley, and I remember when we brought orange juice in, and we actually sold grapefruit juice also, and it was just a, a wonderful, phenomenal product that – we loved, and um, due to the freezing of the, the orange trees, they lost their crop, and then we battled through that for a couple of years, and then we ended up having to move away from the orange juice pool. But um, So you got that one wrong, Jordan. It's okay. There we go. <laughs> it is okay. You can redeem yourself. <laughs> Let's see. Jordan, we've got a question in the chat. Can you, fair, can you share a favorite memory of from one of the days on the farm? Um I know you've been like connected to farming for a long time. So this could be from your childhood or it could be from your adult life. It was these two friend cows. We had Nestle and Hazel and uh, it's a fun story to talk about them. It's just a really neat story to talk about cows and cow behavior and it sticks out. And I've told the story a lot of times, but we had these two cows, Hazel and Nestle, and they were born at the same exact time. And Mm. uh, they grew up together, spent their life together. And then unfortunately Hazel went blind and just plain out couldn't see anything. She'd be in the field with the cows right now and be singled out by herself. And she'd be just petrified and mooing and everything else because she didn't know where she was at. And Nestle was like her caretaker and Mm. would just go with her everywhere. And then just due to their pregnancies, they were separated for a while. And then one time, (laughs) this is where we really learn from it, is that uh, I forget who got put in the, Hazel was in the pen of milk cows and Nestle had had a baby. And when we put Nestle in with the milk cows, she went and found Hazel right away. And they mm. hung out together and then, um, yeah, and they were just always together. And so I don't know, I don't know what they knew about each other as far as the one being blind or not, but Nestle was always with Hazel to take care of her and lead her to the field and take her to water and take her to take her to everywhere she needed to go. And, uh, mm. it's one of those things that if I were to hear that story, it'd be like, yeah, yeah, right. But I mean, we watched it for several years in a row take place. So it's just, it's just a really cool story of cows and nature mm-hmm. and them working together. Mm-hmm. They know how to take care of each other. In connection. That's so sweet. So, Jordan. Yes. You want to ask him another question? I think that was a good question. What is your least favorite smell on the farm? Uh, I'll just go with sour milk. You know, every once in a while you get some milk that yep. gets put in a bucket and it gets left there for overnight or something on accident. And then, uh, or let's say like two or three days on accident. And then you lift the lid or like what's in here. And you're like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Um, and then you run away. Yeah. I guess we could circle right yeah. around on that question and say, what's your favorite smell on the farm? Fresh cut hay. Doesn't get mm. any better than that. Same. You're out here in May. We're usually doing first cutting hay in May. And you get out here and that first time you're cutting hay and it's just like, oh, man, they need to make a candle scent. Like that. <laughs> yeah. so. Can you tell us about what it's like to live on a family farm? Um, you talked a little bit about, you know, you're a sixth generation farmer. Um, what is that like? How's it like, like who makes up your family and, uh, do you still farm with your family? 
Yeah, it's pretty cool. So uh, as I said before, I'm married and I got three kids. So my boys are um, getting old enough that they can come hang out and work with me a little bit. Um, my oldest is eight and my other one's five. And uh, so they like riding in tractors and doing stuff like that. My daughter likes riding with me in tractors as well. And um, I, I farm and then my dad, he's out here a lot and he helps move fence and drive tractor and all that. So I get to hang out with my dad and my sons um, on a regular basis. And then my grandfather, uh, so my dad's dad is also still alive and uh, he's 87. And um, so he actually lives in this house that's behind me where that white barn is in the distance. And so him and my grandma are both still alive. So we get to see them all on a daily basis. So there's four generations alive on the farm right now. And that's a, that's a pretty special thing. It's pretty neat that we get to uh, hang out with them and work with them and uh, be along their sides for so much of our life. Mm. Thanks for sharing that, Jordan. That's really special. I got another question ready for us already. So um, what is the best way to support new farmers? So what's the best way for people to support a farm? I would say the best thing that you can do to support young farmers and, and especially small family farms is going to be supporting a co-op like Organic Valley, uh, right. a company that's really devoted to taking care of small family farms and keeping farmers on the ground and uh, keep uh, the practices and management practices that we're doing here. Um, so, yeah, go out and buy as many OB products as possible. That would be uh, that would be the best way to support uh, family farms, young farmers. Uh, I think Organic Valley has some of the youngest farmers uh, in the country as far as co-op wide. We have a pretty young uh, average age of farmer. So that right there would show that we got young farmers and by buying OV products, you're supporting us. Well, happy National Farmers Day to all who are joining, to all people who inspire farmers, to people who are farmers, people who love farmers, all the stuff. Also, we've got a cow out and oh yeah, somebody's got to get on that. It's not us. It's not our job. It's not our job. And it's not Jordan's job, thankfully. No cows are out at your house. Yikes. Not right now. We'll see. Not right now. (laughs) It's true. Uh, Jordan, how many cows do you have in total? We've talked about your herd a lot, but I don't think we've talked about how many you have. Uh, About 300, 350 maybe, if you counted some of the babies and bulls and whatnot. How many are you milking at one time? Uh, we're milking about 300 right, or 250, I guess, right now. Mm-hmm. On a side note, that cow right there is laying with her baby. Oh, yeah. So that's 6988, and that's her baby laying aside of her. And that's not something that you're going to see every single day. And, oops, I'm in the wrong direction. <laughs> um, Hi, guys. That's, that's pretty cool. OV as a whole, as a co-op, I think we have the uh, pretty low average, about 80 cows per herd, and that's mm-hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. we have 35 in my house so it's really really small um 35 milking cows yeah yeah Yeah, it doesn't take that long that's why i can like (laughs) do the milking and come to this still come to work yeah exactly Uh exactly well that's one that's the the most fun one of the for me personally one of the things i love about farming and working with cows is I love being with the cows every single day. You know, I could hang out out here, not on the phone for hours and rub on them and pet on them and watch what they're doing and it's just it's fun being around cows Mm-hmm. And we have 35 cows. You can definitely know every single one of your cows inside and out and know every little personality quirk and every little detail about them. And Absolutely. that's fine. For better or for worse. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a couple of those cows that are just, oh, man, they just try to push your buttons. So, Oh, one's laying down, taking yeah. a rest. So this is kind of like where they take their naps. This is where they eat. They take their naps during the day. This is where they're chilling. Yeah, this is where they live their life um, on our farm. So on our farm, we're trying to be out on the field grazing 270 to 300 days of the year. And uh, mainly because it's, this cow's great. She's still nibbling on grass while she's laying down. Um, <laughs> you know, cows were, in my opinion, this is how cows are meant to to live their life is to be out on, you know, they would have naturally been out on the plains and grazing and getting gra- drinking water, grazing and laying down, reproducing, making babies and just living their, their life. And we're mimic- mimicking that as closely as we possibly can. And so, yeah, these cows are essentially besides going up to get milk and get some breakfast. Uh, these guys, these girls are all living their life out here. They're going to spend 270 to 300 days of the year out here. And, um, yeah, so they lay down in it. It's soft. I've even seen ads before where it's like, you know, these special beds for cows, 
bring the pasture indoors. It's like, yeah, we'll just leave the pasture out where it's at and let the cows go yeah. lay down in it. So, but yeah, they live their lives out here. So they sleep out here. They socialize with their friends out here. They eat out here. They go to the bathroom out here. And then uh, tomorrow they'll be in the very next paddock over. That way they're in a very, very clean environment to start their next day over with. So uh, we're always returning cows to a new paddock, as I'd said before, because they're grazing off what's here. We're trying to pat, size their paddock just right so that the amount of feed that's available is the amount of feed that they need in a day. And then uh, they can do all their manuring and they're sleeping and laying down. And then we'll new, move them to a fresh piece tomorrow. That way tomorrow they have a very fresh salad that's been prepared for them. How long before they're back on this pasture again then? So once they've grazed it today, when will they come back to this same piece of pasture? Like 30 so days we do, or two weeks or... We do a 32 to 35 day rotation. So uh, being that it's mid October, this might be their last time out here for this year. Yep. It's possible that they'll come back out again. Just that kind of depends on the weather. And uh, uh, especially when you get late in the year, sometimes you get a little bit of rain and a little too wet to have cows out. Um, but yeah, about 35 days would be normal. So for us, we're trying to be out in the field by 1st of April, 10th of April, somewhere in that range. And then basically every 35 days, they'd be coming back to the same piece. Um, the way our grazing system works is we have a, a lane. So the cows come out here on a, an improved laneway. And then we have a fence on that laneway. So our paddocks are never the same. So, you know, this time, this morning I set them up a 12 post paddock. Uh, last night they were on a seven post paddock just because we knew they were going to be out there a little less hours just due to what was going on yesterday. And yep. then um, it's variable. So every time we set up a paddock, you know, next time they come through here, if there's a ton of regrowth, they maybe only get, they'll get 10 posts. And then the next time, if there's little regrowth, maybe they'll get 14 or 15 <coughs> posts. And that's uh, the spacing that we give them. And so it's, uh, it's a really cool grazing design. Um, I'm sure other people are doing something similar or the same. Um, I don't know. And then we also have water out here in the field for them. So the cows are, they always have access to a water in every single paddock, no matter where we put them. And they always have access to fresh, fresh paddock. So there's the lane that, yep. that we'd go down. That's for like tomorrow, they'll go further down that way. That's the direction they came from was down that way. And then, um, well, I'm about as far away as I can be from the water. And then they, we have a buried water line out here. So the cows, um, always have a water, uh, trough that they can drink from. And so we drain that every single day. That way it's always fresh, always clean. Um, but it has a float in it so that it's always full as well when the cows are out here. So food, water, like a bed for naps, sounds like the best situation ever to yeah, me. Yeah, I'd like um, to think so, especially I've for also a cow. Seen you, I've also seen you, Jordan, on our TikTok page um, laying in the pasture. So it's the pasture's not just for cows. It can also be for farmers to take naps or to, to get kisses or whatever you're going to do. So you can definitely find more content of Jordan's on our YouTube page, our TikTok, Instagram. He's everywhere. Like I said before, he's a little bit of a celebrity. We love him here at Organic Valley. He's definitely a big deal. <laughs> Jordan, um, there was a question earlier about how much milk does one cow produce in a day? So can you give us a little bit of idea of how much milk one of your cows is producing? So our cows average around 50 pounds of milk a day. So um, 50 pounds. There's 50 nice pounds. Perfect. Look at there's the water. There's the water. And that's where they get the fresh, fresh water. water. Absolutely. So Jordan, there was a question a little bit ago um do cows like belly rubs or what kind of scratches like what oh, are they you like behind cows? the ear okay. behind the ear behind is the, the ear. sweet spot of course nobody's gonna be around here that's gonna let me show it off i bet but you know they're all gonna be camera shy but yeah behind the ear if you can get let's see if you want behind the ear rub no no you <laughs> no. Not today. Nope, nobody wants one Oh, here, here we go. I think we got to take her. We got, I think it's princess coming back. Princess. Nope, it's Thank not princess. Gosh, princess. Oh, yeah. Come back. We nope, missed you. it's not. She's, she's walking away from me. Turn no, but head. generally right there behind the ear, <laughs> you really dig in behind their ear. And then once you get that going, they like to put their head up and then yeah. just underneath their chin or their neck. They just really love it. And you get, they, uh, you know, unlike people, they like really rough, you know, you really mm -hmm. got to dig your fingernails yeah. into them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, Thanks. We've got a really quick question here. Uh, speaking of weather, do the cows mind the rain? 
Uh, as long as it's warm, generally, no. The, the, one of the worst things you can do for a cow is have them in like 32 to 38 degree weather with rain yeah. because that just sucks the heat out of them. But when it's, in fact, in the summer when it's warmer out, they'll love the rain. They'll be all standing in it and whatnot. We used to, <laughs> I used to have this cow named Bailey and we'd spray him with water sometimes. It was really hot. And she was the most obnoxious cow ever to spray with water. She would put her face in it and just, she loved, loved it. You it. could spray her for an hour straight with a water hose. And she just loved getting water sprayed all over her face. But uh, no, they don't mind the rain. They don't mind the snow. We've had cows out here before grazing through the snow um, where we've gotten kind of an odd season snow or something like that. And uh, yeah, they don't mind the cold. Their comfort zone is a lot larger than that of people. And also they like it cooler than people. We've got uh, some folks um, from homesch homeschooling in Wisconsin here. Look at – See, that's that under-the-chin rub. Uh, that's what they just You can tell that that, right that feels good. Oh, yeah. That looks good. Oh. Jordan, how do you keep track of all the cows' names? Like you've got, you know, 300. You know, mo a lot of our teachers right. are trying to keep track of handfuls of students' names, and they're doing a great job. How do you keep track? So we actually have numbers in all their ear tags and that's what we keep okay. track of as far as for record keeping. But then you get cows like this one that's right here. This cow right here is Pi and she's Pi because she was born on 314. So she was born on Pi Day mm. and that's her name. Um, <laughs> but you, you know, you're with these girls every single day and you're walking through them and you just start to know them like you know your friends or you mm. know other, you know your pet and you just know who they are. So you just remember their name. Mm -hmm. but you wouldn't forget your friend's name. So, nice. and you get, you get a cow like princess who's a real stink pot and you just see her all the time. <laughs> You're not going to forget her name. Um, yeah. and they, a lot of them have fun stories to go with it or you, you just, you remember that, you know, your cows, you're around them all the time. And so, that's right. yeah, that's how you remember their names. Mm. I got a question here from the silo for you, Jordan. Um, what advice would you give to someone who is interested in being a farmer but doesn't have any background in farming. Join the dairy grazing apprenticeship program. Mm. So there's a, a program called DGA. It's called, which is for the dairy grazing apprenticeship program. And it helps place people either with non-farm backgrounds or that don't have the ability to farm anymore or something backgrounds. And it gets you put on farms uh, that are grazing dairies. So that'd only be for grazing dairies, I guess. Um, and it'll help you find a farm that's looking for um, work, but also has a, I believe all the farmers have to have a mindset behind that, that they want to teach these people, you know, teach them the ropes, teach them how to do this, how things work um, and all that. But yeah, dairy grazing apprenticeship program. That's really good advice, Jordan. I think it is important for, for people to get on a farm and work on a farm and learn to work ethic and get up in the morning and do the chores they don't want to do to enjoy the stuff they do like to do and find out what they want to do. Jordan, we were just talking about your cows' names, but how old is your oldest cow in the herd right now? So we started milking in 2015, and we still have, I believe, eight or ten of our original cows. So they would all be 2013 babies. So they'd all be 10. Um, and then I had one that we don't have anymore that was 10 or 11. But yeah, we have a handful of 10 year olds, um, which are going strong. In fact, that cow that was laying down with her baby that we saw earlier, she's one of those 10 year olds. Mm -hmm. So 6988, she had a 2013 uh, birthday. Wow. Wow. And is the leader of your herd uh, an older cow or a younger cow? How do they decide? No, it's it's 9.54. I just saw her a second ago. Um, I don't know where she went. How I did, That's a great question. How they decide, <laughs> I don't know. But what cracks me up, and it blows my mind, is in our heifer and dry cow group, um, we have a cow in there, 29078. And she's clearly one of the chief cows in that herd because the other day we were filling the water and we were just new to a paddock or whatever. And they're all coming up to drink and drink. And she came up and got a drink, walked off. And then like five minutes later, while the cows are still fighting to drink, she just walks through the whole group and everybody just clears a path for her. She walks up, gets a drink, and then she's standing there stretching and doing all these other, you know, mannerisms. And it's like, goodness gracious, girl. And, uh, but she's definitely either top or one of the top three in that group as far as who's in charge. But how they decide, I don't know. But anytime you add a group of cows to the pen, they'll reestablish a hierarchy. Um, we have a cow, Twyla. We don't have her anymore either. And she was always the bottom. She was always like the bottom cow. It didn't matter 
what they're doing, Twyla's going to be last, and she's not allowed to eat where she wants. She's not allowed to lay down where she wants. And you'll see a cow that's the leader cow. If she walks over and she wants, which they do this, and it's great. These cows have all the space in the world, right? And there'll be a cow that'll walk over to, let's say, this white cow in the background and decide that she wants to lay right there in her spot. And she'll walk over and look at her, and then that white cow will stand up walk away all put out and then the cow that just kicked her out will lay down right in her spot and it's like what on <laughs> earth why would you do that but i don't understand why the bottom cow moved and i don't understand why the top cow just like to show their dominance or something but spot. but huh. yeah but sometimes they'll fight it out so they'll do but i don't know exactly how they work that out but mm-hmm. they do respect it which is interesting and so it's a when secret Bridget that was, they're gonna keep it is, but when Bridget was the lead cow for many years, she um, she had her spot where she would eat, and nobody, no other cow would ever even like attempt to dethrone her. She was just in charge, and she had a little sidekick named um, Shiloh, and Shiloh mm. was like her little uh, little yapping dog that was by her side all the time that would run around, and she'd be so excited when Bridget was in the pen. So it was it's interesting, it's fun watching them. That's for sure. Jordan, do you have any other animals on your farm or are you, do you just have cows? I think we maybe saw a dog earlier. Yeah. There's a dog running around out here with, oh oh my gosh, I wish we had it on video. The dog is getting chased by a cow. What? The dog is being chased by a cow. Yeah. Can I flip my video screen? How do you do this? I can't over there. there there That that black cow. There you go. You can see it. Can I zoom? I can't zoom in on it. So yeah, that uh, that black cow in the distance is chasing the dog. Oh, there they go. Um, yeah, so we have a dog. I actually have like three dogs, and then um, we have chickens. So we really like following the cows with chickens. Uh, unfortunately, our chicken coop is, is under reconstruction right now. Mm-hmm. And um, but so one of our part of our grazing management and our nutrient management would be like over here the cows have grazed as we'd follow this with chickens and the chickens come out and the chickens love cow poop as it turns out and they scrape apart the cow patties and they eat the fly larva out of it and they eat other stuff out of it and I don't really know what else the chickens eat but they really make a mess out of the cow patties and it really helps spread the cow manure out mm-hmm. as well sure. as dry that out so that we don't it, it cuts your parasite. Um, your parasite cycle by having a different breed in here. So that's what we use the chickens for. So we have chickens. And then we also usually raise a small group of pigs. We've raised a sheep before, a couple of sheep. We used to have this sheep named Dilbert. And Dilbert, Dilbert. was the funniest sheep you'll ever meet because we left him with cows. He thought he was a cow. And then we'd come out with a milk bottle every day, all the way until he was mature. We would bring a milk bottle and then go, ah! And he'd come running from half a mile away, <laughs> jump in, he'd be leaping in the, the air. He's all Bravo. excited. Yeah, yeah, like, oh, it's time for my bottle of milk. And then uh, we would feed him his bottle of milk. So, yeah, that was Dilbert, the sheep. But, um, yeah, we have some other animals every once in a while. Um, up next, we will have uh, Stephanie Trannell here in Wisconsin um, with Clovis and Kate. So we're really excited about that. Um, maybe one last question for you, Jordan. I saw, um, we, like, like I said, I have said this whole stream, we have a lot of students and there was a, um, there was a question earlier. What is your biggest cow? So we want to get that question answered for all of our school folks joining. And can you estimate how large your biggest cow is? I'm going to go with, I can't see her now again. We're going with blue dozer. I'm not positive that she's blue the dozer's cow, coming back, but she's. She's standing over there. She's definitely one of the tallest. She's, uh, depending on the time of the year, one of the thickest. That's partially why she got her name, Blue Dozer. Oh, right there, Blue Dozer. I'm going to guess she weighs, I don't know, 1,600 pounds. 1,600 pounds. Well, Jordan, this has been super fun to get to see your farm. Um, Like I said to everybody earlier, Jordan is in Ohio. He's an Organic Valley member. We are celebrating National Farmers Day, and we've just been really blessed to take a peek at Jordan's day. He's going to be back later. Um, It was great to chat with you, Jordan. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching.